Maurice Ravel's Pavan for a Dead Princess, Pavan pour une Enfant Défunte, is one of those pieces that can make you stop dead in your tracks and just bask in the painful beauty it exerts. Ravel was a contemporary with Debussy, and his music can generally be called impressionistic, leaving you with an impression of something that the music evokes. The Pavan is one of his early works, written in 1899, while he was still studying at the Paris Conservatory under Gabriel Fauré. And it quickly became one of his most famous pieces. It's not very typical for Ravel's piano music. He didn't consider it to be his best, and it's in a way similar to what the C-sharp minor prelude was to Rachmaninoff, they were frustrated that an early piece got all the attention instead of their later music. Most of Ravel's piano music is quite restrained and refined and delicate and poised and a bit esoteric in those kind of qualities. I'm talking about the Jadot and the sets of Miroir, Valls Noble Sentimental, Tombeau de Couperin, and there's also a more virtuosic side in Gaspard de la Nuit and the G Major Piano Concerto. The Pavan is more direct in a way, even if it's also restrained. And there are bursts of emotion that's not so common in later Ravel, which makes this into an unashamedly gorgeous piece of music in the words of Paul Roberts in his book on Ravel's piano music, Reflections. So what is a pavan in the first place? Well, it's an old processional dance from the Renaissance period. It's slow and in two or four time. And actually, Fauré has written a pavan that is also sad and beautiful in this noble way that also is in Ravel's pavan. And the composition is not meant for dancing, but you should still feel a kind of accommodation for slow dance steps in this noble way. And regarding the tempo here, there are some opposing facts. It says in most scores a quarter note of 54, but actually the first edition it said 80, but that feels way too fast. And Ravel himself played it sometimes slow, but in a piano roll recording that exists when Ravel plays, it's fast. So it's very contradictory, <laughs> these facts. And there's a great story when a student played this in a very slow tempo. Ravel said to him, I wrote a pavan for a dead princess, not a dead pavan for a princess. So it shouldn't be too slow either. So let's look at the structure of the piece. It's in simple A, B, A, C, A form with the A theme returning two times with different accompaniment textures and two episodes in between with new material. And the theme is this very straightforward melody in legato on the top. And the accompaniment is we have a bass note kind of like Thick pizzicatos by the double bass with this marking of staccato and tenuto, kind of thick staccato, but we need to use the pedal for all of them so we don't get the, the rest in between, but this is the touch we, we use. Like that. And then the accompaniment motor of chord notes in between here in the right hand. The staccato and everything. And then the second phrase. Mm, this lovely descending sequence, so in the melody. Again, and third time. And the harmony here, we start kind of in G major, like it's established G major the first half of the bar when it's G major and then we get the fall in the bass down to C and we get this pure C major 7th chord that is so nice.
and then the sequence in the second phrase goes over the circle of fifth that makes this really nice feeling now listen for the bass a d so this is a classic circle of fifth and there's an, an idea here with the harmony that we have all this seventh in the bass that creates these lovely dissonances but they're still kind of tonal so in the traditional functional harmony we talk about the triadic harmony so most of you may be familiar with this but uh, it's on every scale note in G major scale here we have a triad and it's G major and then it's different major and minor and diminished on the seventh but here what if we instead of a triad make a four note chord with an extra third on top so we have a seventh chord and we use only the diatonic scale in G major what chord will it be on the different scale notes so in G we get the major seventh and then the minor seventh minor seventh major seventh the dominant is a default a normal seventh minor seventh and diminished seventh and the idea here is that these chords you can think about the harmony that these chords are more root chords the seventh here are more for a root position of a chord instead of leading notes that normally the seventh are this is also the case in blues music but they have another set of sevens as they regard as more root seventh chords and in this phrase, this is exactly the type of chord that Ravel uses. And the idea is just that we can think about these chords as more as root chords and not as a functioning leading note so much. Eventually end up on B minor and then we get a, a closing statement and now we're firmly within B minor with modulated and it's actually with this cadence we get the seventh chord on the F sharp so we can kind of say it's B Phrygian minor with uh, this diminished dominant now we get a third phrase that's kind of closing the section and it's always this character of looking backward uh, we're going down in the direction and with this lovely legato melody now we get a little arpeggio You can feel the melody is more coming to a close here. But this is E minor, we've modulated locally here to E minor, and then we get another closing statement, and it's this strong, thick chords here. like ending the whole section uh, on a large uh, larger and a bit of exciting ninth chord but back to B minor so when we start it sounds like it's in G major because it starts with a major but then as we can see it's kind of B minor and E minor and B minor so it's a bit too much minor for a piece in major so it has this quality of kind of sliding between the tonalities uh, within this territory of one sharp keys. And it's a bit similar to another Frenchman, Eric Satie, in his Gymnopédies, he's even more meandering throughout the keys in modes in music. Now, for the first episode, we get some new material, but it's pretty similar to the first section. We have the melody in legato, but it's now in a higher register and we have repeated chords instead uh, in the right hand. And 
and the bass has fixed notes and you get this really nice atmosphere. Bass is staying on the B as a pedal point. Until now it goes down. Get some thick chords here in the middle. And now we get basically a repeat of this phrase, but Piano pianissimo, like even softer. And now the bass is moving slightly, but it has also longer note values. Going through the circle of fifth. So now these chords, they're getting kind of stronger and thicker and more fleshy each time. Now we have some more sharps here. And the final time. This sounds a bit like Debussy with these parallel ninth chords. so I can change the page. Now we get the theme returning but it's in one octave higher in the register and it has a new texture with arpeggio chords that is harder to play than the first time because we need to balance the hand, the voicing of having the strong melody and soft chords. So beautiful this chord sounds. And the harmony here is actually slightly different than the first time. Uh, I didn't think about this until I really analyzed it, but the first time we have this circle of fifth as you remember, and now the second time the, uh, look at the bass. It's only descending thirds this second time. Instead of the fifth. And it gives it even more of this modal quality kind of never using the leading notes in the normal tonality. Uh, we're staying in this really nice atmosphere. Okay, B minor, free gen cadence. And this is the same closing statement, pretty much exactly, just slightly more fuller in the register and the chord notes. For the closing statement, it's a, one of these emotional outbursts, fortissimo, and large is broad and large. Really get to, to uh, come down on this G major 7. So, so nice. And now the second episode kind of uh, interrupts here. Subitement, très doux et très lié. Uh, suddenly, very soft and very legato. So it's kind of the same uh, character as the first episode though, in this register and, and the legato. But harmonically we're now uh, a bit far away from the normal tonality with the 
sharps, G major. This is more in D minor and D minor territory. And we get just these chords rolling. And now up again, and now we get a nice counter voice in the left hand. Same kind of chords, but they're growing more. And a lovely chromatic descent here in the middle voices. minor and then we get again a repeat of this material as in the first episode it's pretty much exactly the same repeated it's just more elaborated now with some ornaments arpeggios and some more hand crossings For the final time, uh, Ravel has tenuto marking on these chords. Before it's always staccato and tenuto, but for the final time it's tenuto from the start. It's really a minor detail, but still nice. Notice how these outbursts they get bigger as the piece progresses. Okay, now we just have the final return of the A section and the melody here. And now we have a new texture again, and this is slightly mechanical texture that Ravel was fascinated by. This is very often in his music you get a kind of mechanical motion going on, providing momentum and texture as we get here. This is even harder to play because it's big for the hands and to keep the legato melody in the top. It's really, I, I play some notes in the left hand instead to, to make it possible, but still it's very hard. We get the same kind of closing features. Now the final statement, it, it's the biggest of them all with more arpeggios. the open fifth on G, not major or minor, just the open fifth. And it's really cool ending with a grand gesture like this, very, very worthy manner. I would say the secret of this piece is the way it alternates and goes between the different registers. Often a new section starts in the high register and then gradually falls down to the middle and low register and we get these nice thick chords that are this is the human bodies dancing on the ground. It's made of flesh and blood. 
and the high register is like a sweet voice coming from heaven in the still and soft manner. And it's so fitting for these feelings of longing or grieving and missing something that once was but is no more. The princess infant was dancing the pavan, but she is not anymore. She has ceased to exist. Defant. And it's so powerful how, how Ravel managed to go between these states. I hope you like this music as much as I do, and I will have a video with my rendition of it here that you can check out. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets and subscribing, and thanks to all my Patreons, and I'll see you in another video, maybe one of these to the right.